relation to this disease is worldwide, it's epidemic, it's in six continents. And uh, a lot of researchers believe that a billion people are infected. It's a worldwide epidemic. And uh, as much as 15% of the population uh, right now is infected with Lyme disease, and many of it is seronegative. There's another sort of criteria, and that is that, and I think all of the presenters today would agree because I've sort of heard it in what they're in their remarks and that is that no test is a hundred percent it just plain doesn't happen any change in child behavior school achievement mood or physical state deserves a comprehensive organic workup I've seen too many too many cases of psychiatric presentation who were not worked up not for Lyme but with organic, typical organic workup, with neuroimaging, etc., and Lyme should be part of this work. Just because they get better on antibiotic doesn't mean that it's because of uh, an, an organism. Often the inflammatory process is uh, involved, and especially with chronic uh, uh, Lyme arthritis, I mean that does you know appear to be a chronic inflammatory arthritis, just like rheumatoid arthritis or others, and, and disease-modifying agents. And we have no special criteria that we're going to use uh, to evaluate people who have, are treating Lyme disease in a variety of ways. And one of the reasons I wanted to have a, a, a panel of differing practitioners here is to, so we can all understand there are different ways of trying to do the same thing. We will treat everybody fairly if, however, for some reason, the physician in question does other things that breach the standard of care, then we have to act accordingly. My name is Dr. Paul Mead. I'm a medical epidemiologist with the Division of Vector-Borne Infectious Diseases, the National Center for Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, uh, which is uh, part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I would like to thank you both for the invitation to be here this afternoon. Uh, it is a pleasure. I will concentrate, as requested, on two main issues within my statement. CDC funding for states to report Lyme disease and the surveillance case definition for Lyme disease. Let me first provide a brief overview, however. Lyme disease is the most prevalent vector-borne infectious disease in the United States. It is one of the nationally notifiable diseases with more than 23,000 cases reported to CDC in 2002. If not diagnosed and treated in the early stages, Lyme disease can result in serious complications. Laboratory testing for Lyme disease has improved but greater understanding is needed of its performance in clinical practice. CDC's Lyme Disease Prevention and Control Activity is a science-based program of education, research, and service which partners with the National Institutes of Health and other federal agencies, state and local health departments, and other non-federal organizations. CDC supports national surveillance, epidemiologic response, field and laboratory research, consultation, and educational activities through intramural initiatives. CDC also funds collaborative studies on community-based prevention methods, improved diagnosis, and understanding of pathogenesis, tick ecology, and development and testing of new tools and methods for tick control. CDC's budget for Lyme disease is allocated each year by Congress. CDC received $7.1 million for Lyme disease in fiscal year 2003 and $7.4 million in 2002. CDC distributes the majority of these funds to states and universities in the form of cooperative agreements. CDC has mapped the national distribution and risk for Lyme disease and has defined environments, activities, and behaviors that place people at high risk of infection. CDC has developed new and effective devices and methods for preventing infection and safely reducing vector ticks in the environment, such as insecticide-treated rodent bait boxes. CDC developed and improved and standardized diagnostic tests for Lyme disease and provided physicians standards for the use of these tests. CDC's research programs have provided an understanding of the pathogenesis of infection with Lyme disease bacterium and of transmission of the bacterium by ticks. Lyme disease and other emerging tick-borne infectious diseases are cause of increasing concern with regard to public health and safety in the outdoor environment. CDC's, pro CDC's program for 2004 and beyond emphasizes the goal of working with Lyme disease endemic communities 
to develop integrated pest management approach, which includes a wide assortment of practical tick control strategies. IPM, or integrated pest management, employs environmental management, biological and chemical control of ticks, and enhanced personal protection through tick avoidance and other measures to prevent Lyme disease. Other areas of research include the development of natural forest products for use as an environmentally acceptable alternatives in pest control, deer and rodent targeted methods of insecticide application, further efforts to predict Lyme disease risk on a national scale, and further understanding of host immune responses to infection with the Lyme disease bacteria. Continued education and implementation of improved laboratory tests for early and correct diagnosis and treatment will further the trend of reducing complications of Lyme disease. Uh, as may be mentioned by Dr. Baker, CDC works closely with the National Institutes of Health on fundamental research related to immune responses and diagnostic development. As previously mentioned, CDC distributes most of its Lyme disease funds to states and universities via cooperative agreements. In accordance with federal rules and regulations, cooperative agreements are awarded competitively based on objective review of proposals submitted by state health departments and other applicants. In general, Lyme disease cooperative agreements are recompeted every three years. For over a decade, the Connecticut Department of Health has competed successfully for CDC Lyme disease funding, with the amount of funding increasing from approximately $140,000 in 1991 to approximately $845,000 per fiscal year in 2003. Connecticut universities have also competed successfully, receiving just under $490,000 in CDC cooperative agreements in fiscal year 2003. Overall, CDC provided approximately $1.4 million to institutions in Connecticut for Lyme and tick-borne diseases in fiscal year 2003. As a partner in the cooperative agreement process, CDC is responsible for assuring that the overall objectives of cooperative agreements are modified over time to reflect new information and changing public health goals. In general, the overall objectives of Lyme disease cooperative agreements have shifted over the last decade from counting cases to devising and testing methods for preventing infection. The Connecticut Department of Health's decision to discontinue mandatory laboratory reporting reflects this increased emphasis on prevention. This particular form of surveillance for Lyme disease, as applied, was costly and relatively inefficient. Money spent on mandatory laboratory reporting decreases the amount of funds available for prevention efforts. In 2002, after five years of mandatory laboratory surveillance, Connecticut had the highest incidence of reported Lyme disease of any state. This is precisely where the state ranked in 1997, the year before implementing mandatory laboratory surveillance. Let me be clear, there is no question that Lyme disease is an important public health concern in Connecticut. The question, <coughs> as emphasized by the patients we heard from today, is ultimately how to prevent it. It is towards this question that CDC cooperative agreements are focused. Let me now say a few words about clinical diagnosis. A clinical diagnosis is made for purpose of treating an individual patient and should consider the many details associated with that patient's illness. Surveillance case definitions are created for the purpose of standardization not patient care.
exist so that health officials can reasonably compare the number and distribution of cases over space and time. Whereas physicians appropriately err on the side of overdiagnosis, thereby assuring they don't miss a case, surveillance case definitions appropriately err on the side of specificity, thereby assuring they do not inadvertently capture illnesses due to other conditions. As adopted by the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, a case of Lyme disease is defined for national surveillance purposes as physician-diagnosed erythema migrans greater than 5 centimeters in diameter or at least one objective manifestation of Lyme disease, musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, neurological, with laboratory confirmation of B. burgdorferi infection using a two-tiered assay. Laboratory confirmation is considered critical for late-stage Lyme disease because the symptoms mimic many other common conditions. Without firm objective evidence of B. burgdorferi infection, persons with other diseases would be counted erroneously as having Lyme disease. No surveillance case definition is 100% accurate. There will always be some patients with Lyme disease whose illness does not meet the national surveillance case definition. For this reason, CDC has stated repeatedly that the surveillance case definition is not a substitute for sound clinical judgment. Given other compelling evidence, a physician may choose to treat a patient with Lyme disease when their condition does not meet the case surveillance definition. In conclusion, addressing public health issues such as Lyme disease depends on a strong public health system and sustained and coordinated efforts of many individuals and organizations. CDC will continue to work with its partners to develop and implement community-wide strategies to prevent Lyme disease, including educational efforts tick control, and the development of improved diagnostic methods. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have uh, a few questions, and I'd like to begin with Dr. Mead, if I may. Um, I think you very articulately distinguished between the case surveillance definition CDC guidelines, often referred to as diagnostic <coughs> criteria, and their focus on standardization and I think you used the word statisticity. Am I repeating that correctly or did I mishear it? Anyway, statistical use. Uh, and the clinical diagnosis, that is patient care issue. And you drew that distinction, I think, uh, very clearly and powerfully. Uh, and yet, uh, I wonder whether it's been your experience. We see it from time to time. You probably, I know you've sat in this room this morning and heard the references to it in, in the <coughs> clinical diagnosis setting whether your experience has been that the CDC surveillance definition continue to be used in that setting as well as in the collection of information used for surveillance? Well, I, I don't know that I can uh, necessarily answer that question. Um, I've certainly heard today that there are uh, patients who feel that they were not given a diagnosis uh, on the basis of that. Um, I think it's important to point out that, uh, first off, when we talk about CDC criteria, um, there's the surveillance criteria, and then there are guidelines for the interpretation of laboratory uh, data. Uh, the, the laboratory testing data guidelines were the result of a uh, meeting, as was discussed, held in 1994 that involved uh, various groups, not just CDC, also NIH, uh, Association of State and Territorial Laboratory, Public Health Laboratory Directors, uh, etc. And those, what came out of that meeting were criteria 
not for laboratory diagnosis, but for interpretation of laboratory tests. And that's an important distinction. Um, and it's an important distinction because, uh, as was also mentioned this morning, a laboratory test, when it comes to diagnosis, is just one bit of evidence. There are many bits of evidence that are important. The history of the patient, have they been bitten by a tick, the nature of their symptoms. I believe that just about any physician uh, that has been here today will reaffirm that, uh, as we are all taught in medical school, don't hang everything on one laboratory test or one finding. You have to consider the alternative diagnoses. Now, uh, so one would certainly hope that physicians would look at these uh, testing criteria uh, as one bit of evidence when they are trying to make a clinical diagnosis as is the case with the many other laboratory criteria which CDC has uh, published over the years for hepatitis and various other diseases. This is not unique to Lyme disease. There are criteria for interpretation of many, many laboratory tests. Uh, and I do not believe that it is common practice for physicians to always uh, interpret a single laboratory test based on, on those guidelines and make a diagnosis solely on that basis. Um, Beyond that, there's the issue of the surveillance case definition and how people uh, apply that to patients. But I, I, I'm not in a position to really say that uh, physicians are routinely turning away patients who they believe have Lyme disease because it doesn't meet one of these criteria. I would hope that they would not do that. If they feel that there is compelling evidence that a patient has Lyme disease, that they would make that diagnosis. That is their responsibility to that patient. I, and I very much respect and, and thank you for that view, which I think is uh, a step forward, perhaps simply articulating what CDC's position has been for some time. But as, as you're also aware, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but going back to uh, the uh, Appropriations Act of 2002, the Congress of the United States said at that point, um, and I'm simply quoting the Appropriations Committee, that it was distressed, to use its word, in learning of the widespread misuse of the Lyme disease surveillance case definition as a diagnostic standard, as well as the deciding factor in insurance reimbursement. Uh, and those decisions are very much a concern to us in Connecticut. Um, and so I guess I'm the, the question on my mind, and I don't mean to, again, make you the spokesman for the CDC on this issue, and you may want to go back and give us a more complete answer from the agency. The budget language uh, recommended that CDC, and I'm quoting, aggressively pursue the correct, pursue and correct the misuse of this definition. This in includes issuing an alert 
to the public and physicians as well as actively issuing letters in play, two places misusing the definition. And I wonder whether you could tell us whether CDC is fulfilling those recommendations and if so, how? Well, uh, it, as you say, I may need to go back to the agency and, and, and get better. Uh, I would but welcome your supple, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're but happy to take a fuller explanation from you if you, if you do. What I would say at, at right now is that uh, certainly CDC has made the statement about the surveillance case definition. It is published on our web page along with the surveillance case definition. I have reiterated that statement here in this meeting. Uh, we will have a mortality and more weekly report uh, summarizing the Lyme disease surveillance data coming out uh, soon and we intend to uh, restate that issue uh, once again to make our position once again known um, that uh, there is a distinction between surveillance case definitions and clinical diagnoses. Well I would I would welcome a, a statement that we can take to some of our insurers so that when reimbursement decisions are made about diagnoses and about treatment, we're able to use that kind of statement more widely and more persuasively. So I thank you very much for, for clarifying. The reporting of lab results is an important indicator of the prevalence of the disease, is it not? several different forms of surveillance um, and I believe that um, the uh, folks from uh, Connecticut who will be following me can give a much better uh, description of some of the issues involved in the decision to discontinue laboratory reporting or mandatory laboratory based reporting. Um, but there are several ways of conducting surveillance. Uh, you can rely on physicians to report. You can do active physician surveillance where you call physicians weekly and find out if they've diagnosed cases, which will capture uh, many of the cases, for example, with erythema migraines who will not have a laboratory report. Um, and I, I'll let them uh, discuss further what's the, the rationale for what they're doing. But I think it's important, um, it's important to recognize that surveillance it's important, but it is, it's not going to prevent the illness. If we simply count cases, and if we put our resources all into simply counting cases, we're not going to get anywhere. And um, in many ways, what has evolved in terms of CDC's philosophy over the last decade, and in the last decade of these cooperative agreements, initially, a decade ago, we didn't really know where the disease was and how common it was. It was a very open question, and surveillance was the burning issue. We needed to get surveillance established to figure out where this disease is and have some idea of its magnitude and whether it was increasing or decreasing over time and spreading. I think our feeling is that that question is apparent now, and what we need to do now is not just count cases. We need to emphasize preventing people from getting infected. And I believe that, uh, to a certain extent, that may have been what uh, motivated the Connecticut Department of Health to make that change. But I think it's a critical issue. Surveillance is a barometer. It tells us the current conditions. And you can buy a fancier barometer, or you can muck with the springs in it. But ultimately, it's not going to change the weather. And that really is our challenge. Well, I, I, I don't disagree with you that ultimately preventing spread of the disease treating it, diagnosing it, all are what is absolutely necessary to ending the epidemic. At the same time, we won't know whether we're making progress unless we're counting the cases. And <laughs> I, I just, again, I don't mean to make you the point person or the, the recipient of 
a position that I have stated to your agency, and you were very gracious to come here, so I'm not berating you. But uh, in my view, we have to find the funding to do the surveillance. Otherwise, we won't know whether we're making progress. We need to count the cases. Uh, we can say, well, this disease now we know is so prevalent it's off the charts, but we still need the charts to do the counting because we won't know whether we've made a dent, let alone real significant progress in fighting it. And the reason why I, I mean, I think you sort of are, are making the case in a way in your description of the tick control measures because, as you put it quite well, what we need to know is whether people are still getting the disease in order to know whether the tick control measures work, and we won't know that unless we're, we're doing the counting. Mm -hmm. Well, and I believe Dr. Hadler will, will clarify some of those issues, but uh, Connecticut has a long and very good history of conducting surveillance for Lyme disease even before uh, it instituted mandatory laboratory-based reporting. So I think it would be a mistake for people to come away with the view that Connecticut has, has abandoned surveillance and is not still uh, capturing cases. The real issue is being able to compare apples to apples and, uh, and not to oranges and to be able to have a sustainable surveillance system. Uh, and that's not just an issue for Connecticut, that's an issue for all surveillance systems for all diseases in all places. If a surveillance system is, is not working and not all surveillance systems work, uh, they simply don't. They prove to be too costly and too inefficient to do their job. Um, and, and often the, the effort is not worth the value gained. You, you, yes, you capture a greater percentage of cases, but the truth is you still know that it's, you, even without that, you would have known that it was common in this town and not common in that town. It was common in this age group and not common in that age group. And you can even, with imperfect or with active surveillance, determine trends over time. Uh, and those really are some of the key issues. I think it's important for everyone to know that all surveillance systems undercount cases. That's true of every single national surveillance system. All surveillance systems undercount. And you can spend more on that and undercount a little bit less, but you'll still be undercounting cases. Well, I, I apologize that I'm going to have to leave a little bit early, but if, if you are taking a message back or any number of messages, I think one of them might well be that Connecticut would like to be a model in a sustainable, accurate surveillance system that fully captures and counts the numbers of cases in a way that enables us to make more intelligent decisions about tick control, improved diagnosis, and more effective treatment, because that's one of the measures of progress that we will make. And I have uh, contacted your agency and will continue to do so on that score. And again, I want to thank you for being here.